our uh, attendees are all settling into our virtual Zoom room here. Um, good evening. My name is Mark Loudon. I'm the director of the Max Cotta Institute for German American Studies at the University of Wisconsin Madison. And I'm very, very pleased to welcome Dr. Simon Bronner this evening uh, to present a lecture. I'm going to give a little bit background on Dr. Bronner. And if I were to go through his entire academic record, it would take longer than the talk that he's going to be presenting. So I'll just give you some highlights this evening. Um, Dr. Bronner is the is currently the Dean of the College of General Studies and Professor of Social Sciences at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Um, more recently, he was a distinguished professor of American studies and folklore emeritus um, at the uh, Penn State University in Harrisburg. He received his PhD in folklore and American studies from Indiana University in 1981. He has an extensive publication record. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. All kinds of books and articles on fascinating topics. Just read a couple of the book titles just to give you a sense of the scope of Dr. Bronner's research program. Folklore, the Basics, Campus Traditions, Folklore from the Old Time College to the Modern Mega University, Explaining Traditions, Folk Behavior in Modern Culture, and Killing Tradition, Inside Hunting and Animal Rights Controversies. He's also edited numerous books, including a four-volume Encyclopedia of American Folk Life, a two-volume Encyclopedia of American Youth Cultures, and something that I have on my shelf, <laughs> an Encyclopedia of Pennsylvania German History and Culture, which is just an amazing go-to reference. Um, Dr. Bronner's um, extensive career has been has received accolades, uh, including the Jordan Award for Teaching from Penn State in 1985, the Kenneth Goldstein Lifetime Achievement Award for Academic Leadership from the American Folklore Society in 2015, and the Mary Turpey Prize from the American Studies Association for Teaching, Advising, and Program Development. And in addition to serving uh, as a faculty member at uh, Penn State Harrisburg, He's had visiting distinguished professorships, including one in American studies at the University of California, Davis. He's been a Fulbright professor of American studies at Osaka University in Japan. He's had the Walt Whit Whitman Distinguished Chair at Leiden University in the Netherlands. And he's also served as a year of visit as a visiting professor of folklore and American civilization at Harvard University. So Dr. Bronner, the topic of Dr. Bronner's talk this evening is from farm to farmer's market. Amish Folk Society in the Age of Fast Capitalism. And I'm very, very pleased uh, to welcome Dr. Bronner this evening. Um, he will be presenting for you know the first 35, 40 minutes, 45 minutes um, of the hour, at which point we will take questions in the Q&A. And so I'll be moderating it then. But now I will turn it over to Dr. Bronner. Gross dank und uh, guter uh, Dag. I am uh, especially happy to uh, be here and, and share this research that comes from my book, The Practice of Folklore, and especially uh, grateful to Mark, who was a contributor to that encyclopedia of Pennsylvania German studies, and he has indeed uh, taught me a lot, and I've always enjoyed our times at, together at conferences, and glad that we could reunite here in Wisconsin. In a way, the talk here is a continuation of the previous uh, talk by Karen Johnson Weiner, in which he talked about the role of Amish women, and it certainly is related. And I think the significance of this work uh, going beyond studies of Amish society is the idea of how do the Amish who seem to uh, counter some ways of uh, modern American society persist and adapt in that society and in fact thrive? That's the basic question that a lot of people in Amish studies and Pennsylvania German studies are asking. And in my special concern of folklore, which Mark mentioned, I'm also concerned about a tradition-centered society in relation to a future-oriented American society and how that is negotiated. What you're looking at to start us on the farm is the Machantango Valley, where I did a lot of my work on Pennsylvania German. It is 
something of an isolated valley where Pennsylvania German language is still spoken. And more recently, Amish have started moving here from Lancaster County. My terminology of folk society uh, does come from anthropology and the idea of John Hostetler and Amish Folk Society, I'm sorry, Amish Society, but he used the Folk Society concept with the idea that uh, the Amish are the quintessential American Folk Society. Previously, anthropologists talked about Folk Society in terms of Latin American peasant societies in Europe and John Hosteller, sociologist, suggested that this model can work for the Amish because they're not separated from society, but they're within it. But nonetheless, they maintain a tradition-centered, homogeneous kind of uh, community. I'll talk about fast capitalism in a moment with you, but first a little history or background uh, by way of prologue. And that is the, a lot of my research, as I mentioned, is in Pennsylvania. And I will be curious in the dialogue how much of these patterns you see in other states, including Wisconsin. The Pennsylvania market town, or what Wilbur Zielinski called the Pennsylvania town because it became established throughout the state was really established 1683 with the arrival of Germans and the establishment of Germantown into a distinctive uh, German pattern. One example near State College in Pennsylvania is in Reebersburg, for example, I give you an aerial shot so you can get an idea of this, but there are these kinds of communities throughout Pennsylvania. In fact, Zelensky was a cultural geographer said that there were more townships established in Pennsylvania than any other area of the colonies. And the features are, as you could see, there is a main street and something of a German pattern of surrounding farms and fields. And at least in the German pattern, often the church would be central to this and the uh, German religions that were indeed there. And often there would be a market and even a market square that would be established in the middle to bring uh, those kinds of goods from farm and integrated into these artisan shops that you would often see here. This town pattern is still very persistent and a feature of it too are these wide alleys that would be providing service for many of the houses that were established. This is going to be significant because of the idea that one of the reasons why the Amish were thinking about the farmer's market and whether this went against their values is because historically it seemed to relate to their history of settlement. The Amish did not arrive until after 1737, and they created these inland folk societies that were connected to the, the secular, what is sometimes called the, the fancy Dutch, uh, but nonetheless uh, kept within their own districts and communities, but they were not separatists in the sense that sometimes we think of the Hutterites, for example, establishing communal society. And a lot of their values and their uh, communality is based upon the Bible and a literal interpretation, uh, which they would read in German. And so I present it to you here. And of course, from Corinthians is this idea, uh, this idea of uh, go ye and be separate. And this is interpreted in dress and transportation and so forth. And then another key feature, which is being challenged in the 21st century, which I'll be talking about, is this idea of go till the land or go cultivate the land, which was one of the dictates after the expulsion from the Garden of Eden, which is in Genesis. Some of it is also symbolic 
the closest to the land and wholesomeness and so forth, but it's also part of the biblical mandate that the Amish live by. In terms of the social and economic organization of Amish farming, it is important to talk about the organization around the family. Uh, often we think of the domestic sphere and the work sphere, even in farming of the English, as the Amish would say, but it, it was very clear in social studies, including the pioneering John Hostetler and later Don Craybill, that there was this idea of the sharing of work and a work as a value indeed on the Amish farm. So you would see scenes like this drawing the attention of a photographer because of a woman plowing there. And the model was not a subsistence model. It was a yeoman farm. They were intended to be small family owned operation, but they were looking for cash crops to bring to market. The slow capitalist, what now we call slow, previously it was just the capitalist basis of yeoman farming, is that it is private ownership. Uh, many people do think that the Amish are a communal society, but that's uh, not the case. They're they would fit into what is sometimes called a communitarian society, uh, but they will have capital goods and they will make investments to produce profit, although they uh, will not always participate uh, within programs of uh, banking and so forth. Uh, and they uh, do believe in competition in the market. Now, industrial capital, capitalism, which grew there, increased the scale greatly beyond the Amish, and the Amish tried to maintain that slow capital basis of yeoman farming. And it, the industrial capitalist model is an increased hierarchy. You're familiar with the linkage of resources and production and a wage system. Now, toward the end of the 20th century, concepts among economists came out about this idea of fast capitalism. And now we even talk about faster capitalism. And a lot of this spurred by the digital communication revolution where the there's cash changing hands uh, without the exchange of cash, if you will, and that the importance is placed upon communication rather than production services, information. So it becomes organizational and consumption oriented rather than a producer society as at least the Amish could share with the other capitalist ventures in the 19th and the 20th centuries. What I am noticing and others have noticed, especially in landmark work such as Amish Enterprise, which I want to give all due credit to uh, by Don Crable and Stephen Nolt is that uh, there has been an Amish industrial revolution far after the late 19th century industrial revolution that we think of as industrial capitalism, but because of the tourist trade in a sense, and also the decline of farming, more and more Amish have entered into what can be called a form of mass production, or if not mass production, larger production than had been occurring before. What you see here, for example, is porch furniture or deck furniture. And this is the so-called Amish bike or a scooter which sells widely in Lancaster County. And in the 60s, the Amish were supposed to be doomed, that they could not keep up with tourism and modern society and capitalism, and they would be doomed because of the destruction of other kinds of folk societies and ethnic societies who tried to maintain a communitarian lifestyle and a tradition-centered lifestyle. And in fact, the opposite has happened, uh, that uh, just from 1960 to 2000, where just in Lancaster County, there were 35 Amish districts are now 204, and there's been a six-fold increase in population. Don Crable predicts that the Amish are tripling their size every 15 years because of uh, large families 
uh, for example, but this is also putting pressure economically and especially on the land. And another statistic that may seem more dire is that the Amish, I'm sorry, not the Amish, the uh, uh, Pennsylvania Land Preservation Group is predicting that Lancaster County loses 1,100 acres each year to commercial development. So the Amish Industrial Revolution includes, uh, of course, sheds is an example, and these uh, bicycles, a lot of trades, building trades that they would engage in, and also animal husbandry and particularly dog breeding, although that has become uh, somewhat controversial and we can get into that later. In 1960, 90% of Amish households engaged in agriculture, and in 2000, it's down to, was down to 33%. And in some presentations that I've heard more recently, uh, that is probably down to even something more like 25%, at least in Lancaster County. And yet at the same time, in that time, there have been 100 new businesses just in the construction trades. And a lot of these businesses are could, what could be called micro enterprises in the craft and tourist economy, including food and craft shops that are quilt shops that are set up, for example. And those micro enterprises run by Amish increased 2000% from 2000 to 2010. What is interesting, especially in considering Amish social organization and whether we can learn from that or whether they are struggling is that they have a 90% success rate uh, that means that they're lasting 10 years or more, where the national average is 50%. That means that half of all new businesses in American society fail. And it's also leading to some other unusual kinds of communications or at least phenomenon, and that is magazines for plain business. And in Amish Enterprise, which I mentioned, which came out in 1985, a lot of the consideration were in these cottage industries, often on their farms. And uh, many of the Amish would be on zoning, zoning boards, although they don't participate in politics, they were on zoning boards to make sure that they could operate industrial equipment on their farms and operate uh, these sheds and building kinds of trades. But what I'm gonna to talk to you about tonight is another phenomenon that's not in Amish enterprise that I've been trying to document and wrote about in the practice of folklore, which is the move from farm stands to farmers markets, especially as the farms have been drying up. This causes some ethical kinds of considerations for the Amish who do believe in smallness or what John Hosteller referred to as the concept of we-ness and the double meaning of small and also family and very community oriented. They did not want to be in a factory model, even though there's pressure to do that as they're producing more of these industrial goods. As it was explained to me by several participants in this movement is that they try to adhere to Das al -Gebrach. The old way is the way they constantly describe it. That's their guideline. Yes, they have a social contract with each other and they wanted to be sure that even though they're adapting and still trying to sustain the family and the economy, that it would be done with the values of the old way. They wanted to avoid bureaucratic structures. They did not want sedentary managers who did not work. Work was still a value. And what is also fascinating to me, they also wanted to be sure that there was not a class structure that emerged of elites. And so part of what some districts did, and I can talk more about this, is that they would put a cap on profits. They would say, it's fine that you're making money in these businesses, but we don't want you to make too much if you're starting to make too much money. Well, either you can donate that or 
uh, try to find ways to curtail it. When how many businesses do you hear doing that? And so the question comes up, well, what about those basic values that I mentioned of being separate and tilling the ground? What you're seeing in the picture is hardly tilling the ground. Uh, one way is the consideration of Gelassenheit or submission. And their, their view was that they were not bowing down to the almighty dollar. And this came up a lot in the conversations that I have. They wanted to be sure that their intention for these kinds of enterprises was a way to keep their families and their communities together. And they were searching for other alternatives that in fact were family centered as well as providing a kind of coziness Hostetler described it as a weeness in uh, Pennsylvania Dutch. They would often tell me, you know, gemutlichkeit, this sense of coziness. Maybe Mark can tell me how he translates it. Uh, but what they were trying to get across is not just that you're a community, but you're an intimate community. You're comfortable and familiar with one another. It's not the kind of venture capitalism uh, that we think of outside. And especially important is the idea of a way to keep the family together if you're not on the farm. One of the appeals of the farm is that it was a family operation. Another factor that I found interesting in this description of slow capitalism is they literally wanted it to be slow. They resisted the idea of deadlines and production quotas and so forth. They would use banks, they would use ATM machines, as you can see here, which is a site that confuses uh, many tourists, but indeed this fits in because they are operating on a capitalist basis, but with a social intent. And what they meant about this Amish time is that they did not want to hurry along. They did not want the businesses to start dictating their weekly structure. They wanted to keep to their family time and try to control the kinds of rushing that they associated with business and the English vendors that they're familiar with. Well, one historic change is the financial crisis of 2007 and 2008. I feel that this isn't widely reported, but certainly I felt this living in Harrisburg and Lancaster County and Berks County, Lebanon County, all those areas have Amish populations that suffered a great deal at that time because uh, many of them were engaged in factory work or cottage industries. And in many cases, uh, they were not asked back. They were let go, not asked back, or those processes were automated, such as Armstrong flooring, which you know of and may not know that uh, previous to 2007, a lot of the workers in the Armstrong plants were in fact Amish, who were displaced on the farm with uh, that kind of family pressure of what are the younger people going to do? And they were moving into factory work in, in that area. And so the question after 2008 in a lot of the communities is, uh, where do we go? What do we do to sustain ourselves economically and continue the communities? In some cases, they left. Uh, there was a movement, as I said, the Mahantango Valley, Upper Dauphin County, some of you are familiar with that uh, area, such as Pillow and Dolphin uh, had an influx of Amish families, especially as some of the former Pennsylvania German fancy families were leaving or their children were not taking up farming and they were moving into those areas. Some were going as far as Wyoming, upstate New York was a frequent uh, destination as well. Now, Many were then thinking, well, what about the farmer's market? What ethical considerations will that have if we start moving into the farmer's market, which seems to be a compromise between being on the farm, which we can't do on a large scale with the scarcity of land and the challenges that there are there economically, but at the same time, it is a place where you can keep the family together. It is slow. And 
also, it seems to be in this craft or producer kind of economy. In 1960, actually, farmers markets were almost extinct. There were only 100 farmers markets recorded by the Department of Agriculture at that time. And that and some of the remaining ones of the 100 markets were in places like York, Lancaster, and Harrisburg. I can also uh, mention Lebanon had one as well that were longstanding since the 19th century. But they were hanging on by their fingernails. In 1976, noting this difficulty for farmers with the extinction of farmers markets, especially as there was a demographic shift the federal government passed the Farmer to Consumer Direct Marketing Act, which directed cooperative extensions to support farmers markets and farmers in uh, consumer in marketing their goods in these kinds of markets. So the number jumped to 1500 farmers markets across the country in 1990. And in 2019, the department estimated that there were around 8,600. That has scaled back some with the pandemic, but still is quite high. But another shift is a lot of those moved to urban markets. So New York City had farmers markets. A lot, Los Angeles has a farmers market. Many of you are familiar with the Reading Terminal Market in Philadelphia, uh, for instance. And so this shifted the view of the German market town, which the Pennsylvania Germans were familiar to, to, to the largest number of farmers markets being in California and New York. Massachusetts being third, Pennsylvania had 281 markets, Wisconsin 298, so still substantial, but not in the top numbers that you would think considering the tradition of farming and of the German uh, market town background. At the same time, after that 2008 crisis, the number of English vendors declined. Already farmers markets were not a big uh, profit to be sure. And because they were only occasional businesses of two or three days a week, many English vendors just pulled out, which created openings for the Amish. Then the Amish had to decide, well, do we go into these urban markets? Is there a way to control the kind of selling that we do to the English? And another big problem was transportation. How do we get to these markets, especially if they mean going over highways, especially for those Amish groups that restrict motorized vehicles? Hiring out of vehicles is quite expensive. And, these were all considerations uh, at this time. The precedence that they did have is relief sales that many of you are familiar with where Amish would set up with stands for bakery goods, uh, less so for produce, but certainly the tradition of bakery goods and other kinds of foods were certainly there and these wholesale food auctions or produce auctions, which were indeed very uh, common. And of course, farm stands, which uh, many farms maintain. The legal issues that help spur some of the Amish toward the farmer's market is that there is an exemption for children working for parents. So children could work without social security taxes for their parents as young as 14 years old, despite child labor laws. And uh, the federal government has scaled that back and that's another challenge right now for Amish families. The CARE Act uh, pushed it to 16 and the Amish were in favor of it uh, staying at 14 because in fact the children would work together with their mothers and fathers in this environment. What it led to is the growth of micro farming. The large farms were hard to sustain, but you would see one and two acre plots being rented and growing produce or taking produce from these auctions and then recycling them or reselling them at these kinds of markets. The problem of the 
number of market days was solved because then they would go on a market circuit, so to speak. They would go to Ephrata, uh, let's say on Tuesdays, Roots would be open then. They would go uh, then to Lancaster on Wednesday. Uh, Harrisburg is Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And they would absolutely refuse to work on Sunday, but that way they would have several days. This is a scene of the Lancaster market and you can see what they also started creating as they began dominating these markets was an interchange with often underrepresented minorities within these urban centers. And I think that's a new chapter that we're indeed uh, looking at. At Harrisburg, I did a count, which I talk about in, in the book. In five years, uh, the number of Amish vendors went from about half to 80% of the vendors in the Broad Street market in Harrisburg, in Lancaster, it was even higher than that. In Lancaster market, uh, it's about 75%, uh, partly because of some of the tourist stands that are there. And the Amish would be involved in meats as well as produce and bakery goods. The reason I say that there's an interaction with minorities is because in many of these urban centers where these farmers markets were now located, there are not supermarkets that we associate with the suburban kinds of development. And so African-American and Latinx communities would come to the farmer's market for their produce in the absence of supermarkets. And from the Amish, they would recognize foods that were familiar to them, raw milk and cheese, pig knuckles, uh, pot pie may be new, but uh, nonetheless, they would uh, recognize the all in one pot kind of system, pickled foods and relishes, fruit butters and jellies, uh, chicken corn and rival soup is distinctive, especially in Pennsylvania, the hot bacon dressing, pudding, which is not milk pudding, as you uh, probably know, it's a, fr it's a meat product, head cheese, also a meat product, and uh, mush, which is made from corn, hog maw, and scrapple. And what I'm also interested in, especially in relationship to the Kade Institute uh, wanting to document German American culture is that there's a kind of Germanification, if you will, of uh, some of these uh, downtown foodways and an, an exchange of cultures that is syncretic, if you will. There's also the dough culture which is very common of the whoopie pies that I showed in my initial slide, the shoe fly pie, the sand tarts, twisted pretzels, the dark breads and apple dumplings, which were German specialties that then became part of the, or they were incorporated into some of these minority groups and their traditional food ways. Here's uh, some of the canning, which also took place. So you're seeing some commodification, which is occurring, chow chow on your right, peaches, uh, cherries, and bacon dressing, which is the, bottled here. Although I did talk to the Amish wondering about branding these, and they are resisting that, wanting this to be uh, the appearance of homemade and fresh and off the farm, even though it doesn't often come anymore from the farm. There's also the sausage culture, which Don Yoder has talked about in some classic articles, which also relates to many of the minorities who are now catering uh, to these groups. So it's not a German audience, but it is an audience that is finding uh, some kind of a symbiotic relationship with the foodways that are there. Although there's a certain kind of branding of recognizing that there are differences in Amish foodways by designating an Amish potato salad, an Amish macaroni, which seems like a contradiction in terms, uh, as well as uh, Amish sausages. There is a supply problem. So in addition to the auctions, if you don't have a farm or micro farming for this and that they will, also increasingly go to big box stores such as Costco and Sam's Club to provide 
materials, but they will often redo that fresh produce, produce in some of the flavoring and traditions of the Amish farmers markets. Well, what are the implications and, and what can we take away from this decided movement that is going on here? Uh, one is, at least in the Amish mind, there's a reconnection to the land, which had eroded, at least in central Pennsylvania, with the, the decline of farming and land available and with the growth of factory work and cottage industries. There's this feeling that the farmer's markets, even with the name, provides an avenue to stay humble, to be Galassenheit in this format, and in fact, even practice Gemutlichkeit because of their connection to one another as families. Part of the issue within the Amish folk society, which is changing, is this empowers more women than had been previously. And there is a very good dissertation by Beth Graybould uh, documenting the shift from the man as the breadwinner to women, All, even though the man is part of the preparation, uh, they are not the primary breadwinner in, in many of these cases. And the farmers markets to the Amish allows them to retain their separateness. So it may not be separateness as you think in terms of, well, the, uh, the town of intercourse is an Amish town or it's a Amish market town, but nonetheless, they see it particularly in these environments where 80, even 90% of the vendors are Amish as a way to maintain their uh, separateness and educationally to remain separate because this is work that does not require a higher degree, which is also a problem when they were removed from factory work, which is unskilled labor because other forms of labor is going to require credentialing, which they still uh, want to resist. So the farmer's market has become this niche economy and a gendered, uh, women-dominated, slow answer to some of the issues of fast capitalism, which they're well aware of. If you see my cursor here, we buy broken iPhones, iPads, iTouch Samsungs. This creates another issue of how much do they use communication devices? One of the ways that they will justify using some of these devices is because of the notion of industriousness. So maybe it's not an industrial revolution as Craybill and Nolte describe, but an industriousness revolution because of the intensity of work that's involved in shipping, transporting, setting up, breaking down, and in sales. And they are providing this Pennsylvania German homemade homeland concept so that even though I've said that a lot of their audience is other minorities and, and not Pennsylvania German, there's also this sense that central Pennsylvania has this farmer's market landscape where then Pennsylvania Germans, when they return to this area as its homeland, rather than a Vaterland in Europe, they view this as part of the cultural landscape that they remember, even though it's different from before. I've mentioned the compensating for the loss of the supermarkets and the reintegration of German foodways into American culture, which because of the health movement was often questioned. So, in uh, closing, I feel I have to mention as a form of epilogue, the impact of the pandemic on what has been called the local foods movement, which was supposed to be a national movement, but what I'm pointing out, at least in certain regions of the country, the local foods movement has become an Amish movement. And what this uh, says in terms of language maintenance, community maintenance, and also economic shifts that affect both the consumers who tend to be non-Amish as well as the producers of the Amish. 
Uh, one thing that is interesting is that many states declared farmers markets as essential services. I was talking to Mark about whether that was the case in Wisconsin. He did not think so. Maybe some will comment on that. But in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania uh, farmers markets, probably because of this impact on communities who did not have access to supermarkets, were declared essential services and could operate with the idea they can maintain social distance because it's not the kind of thing where you're going along aisles and, and picking out products. So that's also another interesting transformation of the Amish uh, folk economy, if you will. The other trend that has been spurred by the pandemic is the rise of the Amish market. And that is a completely Amish run market where they can maintain some of the slowness, if you will, or some of the limits that they want on, on sales. Uh, previously, the markets were managed affairs and they would be paying rent to an English manager. But in Pennsylvania, it has the most Amish markets in the country with 18 right now, at least according to the Department of Agriculture, New York, which also has a, especially in upstate New York, a growing Amish set of communities is at 13. Wisconsin, as you can see there, is tied with Kentucky at seven, uh, mostly in the Western part of the state that are indeed Amish markets. The other implication is a fusing or moving a little more toward fast capitalism and whether the Amish can temper that with uh, the usual kinds of online or social media kinds of sales. Uh, the Amish have resisted social media certainly, but there is an online presence and the rise of what I would call cultural brokers where they would hire website managers so they would not be directly involved, but that could provide outlets for some of their materials as you could see here. And you can do a symbolic reading, certainly, which I will show you in a moment. Here's one, for example. Uh, this is in New Jersey, but it's near the Pennsylvania border. And you could see what I'm talking about with the kind of appeal that they're indicating even in the images or the imaginary, as I call it, of what Amish are about. The dough culture, as you could see here, the meat culture and sausage uh, culture, that would be indicated, handmade goods, Uh, more of the dough culture and sweets. There would be some crafts. In addition, I'm not sure about how, many, how the shrimp snuck in there, but this is where we're seeing, again, some interchange, raw milk and raw cheese. Uh, some nod certainly to health foods as well, and then identifying it as an Amish enterprise. Here's some of the Amish salad that you will see as well. All right, let me move that out. And I want to thank you. There's more that could be said, but you can uh, feel free to read the practice of folklore and let me know. And I do want to give another plug and thank you to Mark for pointing out Pennsylvania Germans, an interpretive encyclopedia, and my co-editor on that, Joshua Brown, who is in Wisconsin and certainly a friend of the Cotty Institute if he's here as well. And then another recommendation besides the Amish Enterprise book, which I would still recommend for the insights early on in Amish economy as a way to maintain folk community is writing the Amish. It was edited by David Weaver Zerker and I contributed an essay on John Hestetler and his concept of the social contract and the folk society. So uh, I'll go stunk. Wow, thank you so much, Simon. That was fantastic. Um, we've got plenty of time for questions and I would invite folks that have questions to type them into the Q&A and then I'll read them for Dr. Bronner. 
So we've got a couple of questions to start off here. And this first one comes from Russell Baldner. And his question is, is there any internal debate or conversation among the Amish within their own community regarding the practice of inviting tourists, for example, tours into Amish communities, which may seem to be so inconsistent with their expressed desire to remain separate and not be on display? There is quite a bit in the tourist economy and especially concern about Mennonites who they feel pose as Amish. So there are many Mennonite enterprises and they aren't always clear on the foodways and they will have uh, dinners that they will have within the farmhouses. The Amish that I talk to tend not to want to go that far to bring tourists into the homes. Groffs, I think, Mark, you know, is mm -hmm. a longtime reputation in that area for providing dinner, what they will call family style, or they will say Amish style dinners without necessarily identifying themselves as Amish. And uh, this is a, a controversy, certainly, and where there are some Amish who have a sour taste in their mouth, excuse the the pun for how far they want to get into the tourist economy and maintain that that separateness. Uh, Mark, you may have some other experiences, but that that is the reaction of the people that I've dealt with in regarding to what their options are if they can't work the farm or if the factories and cottage industries are in decline. Yeah, I've heard exactly that same thing. And it's it's interesting, the whole question of like offering suppers, um, like, you know, is, is kind of made its way to some parts of the Midwest, but some more traditional groups feel very uncomfortable about that. Um, other, you know, more progressive groups, like in Indiana, they do that quite a bit. And it's seen as, you know, you, you basically, you can bring in a, a group of retirees or a tourist group or a church group or something um, for, you know, a flat fee of, you know, $10 a plate or something, $15 a plate. Um, a lot of times they'll set them up, though, depending on the weather in like, say, a shop or a barn. So it's not necessarily in the immediate living space. So it's a kind of sort of in between a, a sort of a restaurant diner type thing, but it's a prefix <laughs> sort of thing. So but it's it's considered a real sort of important cash uh, source for a lot of families. Yeah. But um, again, it's sort of a little bit. And that's you know. a good point for the relief sales, for example, they will sell dinners, but not in, invite the attendees at the relief sales to actually sit down with the Amish. There are places like Good and Plenty that you're undoubtedly familiar with. There must be places like that that also offer communal dining. You sit down on these long benches and they give you a whole pot of mashed potatoes and you're supposed to pass them around as some kind of strange experience that harks back to an earlier age and you will have Amish servers but again they don't consider that crossing the line so to speak uh, for them so they will work as servers in those environments. And I think that says something about the American concept of tradition that the Amish, even though they were not uh, English settlers on the frontier, are interpreted as somehow America's ancestors to that Amish imaginary. We have another question here. It's like, is it maybe a tricky one to answer? Um, how do you know if for example, goods that you would buy from Amish people came from their farm or from Costco or potentially Aldi. <laughs> well, I, I will say if you ask, they will tell you uh, because they do believe in honesty. Uh, there's uh, no doubt about that. Uh, and it is a bind for them because they want to have fresh food. And one of the things I'd like to track as a sequel to this is whether some of the farmers markets that are popping up in more rural areas or trying to uh, are serviced more by the farmers. Uh, the issue is more with, especially in Lancaster County, as there's been a steep decline in the farmlands of uh, how they uh, indeed manage that. But the 
canning, which they do, I think is pretty transparent and they will tell you we, we can this indeed at home. It might be from string beans bought <laughs> at Costco, but they're, they're feeling that it is honest because they're involving their own process. And again, it's a family process. Mm -hmm. Another question here, um, what are the greatest political positions being placed into law or other restrictions by legislatures? So presumably um, some kind of legal or, or regulatory restrictions that may impinge on Amish enterprises like these. Well, they are concerned, or at least people I talk to about the CARE Act and the uh, raising of the minimum age. Um, and this might lead, quite honestly, to a new Yoder versus Wisconsin. Uh, because again, while the Amish do not want to be involved in politics through these brokers, they do want to serve their interests. And you saw that there is indeed magazines that are catering to Amish businesses as they get to this. And this is a large part of the discussion so that they're not going to be lawyers. They're not going to sue by themselves, but they might get others on their behalf if they see this as a case in which their community is being threatened or their values. And that was the basis of Yoder versus Wisconsin, that this is a group that the American government feels is in their interest to preserve or to uh, privilege in that way, even though other groups may be subject to different rules. And does that apply then to commerce? If they are not going to high school, they're not getting uh, credentialed and they want to maintain the family. I, I could see arguments on both sides. Uh, and so be prepared. I would not be surprised if there's a challenge, depending on if the CARE Act is renewed mm -hmm. or not. Um, just a kind of reminder to folks out there that we're not able to take live que or questions that will be posed over like a microphone. So just enter your questions into the Q&A box and then I'll, I'll, I'll read them for Dr. Bronner. Next question is a little bit slightly different, but it sort of rips off of one of the photos um, that you showed. Have the Amish adopted more modern power tools and industrial equipment in their construction businesses? One of your slides show what appeared to be an assembly of roof trusses with a modern fastening tool. Yes, uh, absolutely. And their view is that they're still maintaining handwork on those kinds of building trades. And that's the appeal of it, but they will use power tools. There are some different views depending on the segment of the Amish, which is highly diversified, which is a separate lecture that you've probably had <laughs> on there with different views. Uh, so the, the, even though they're not quite Amish, the Old Order River Brethren uh, use technology uh, quite freely. And many people are surprised that the Wenger Mennonites are more conservative when it comes to that than the a uh, new order Amish in many cases. So uh, that's the view they have, although they will not have those power tools in their home, but because it's in their business, uh, then that becomes legitimate. Mark, let me also mention one other concern legally that has come up uh, just quickly and we could follow up later. And that is on this issue of homogenization of milk, because one of their products is raw milk and cheese, which they would produce that people like. And that there is a market for that because the supermarkets won't sell that. But it is true that uh, the FDA wants to crack down on non-homogenized milk. They will pasteurize. Mm -hmm. So just a quick note. Here's another question. Many of these markets involve significant commutes to locations that do not otherwise have an Amish presence. So this uh, person, Mr. Morris, uh, mentions New Jersey. We could add, say, the Baltimore, Washington area, and even, yeah. I know, New York City. Um, is there any discussion of these factors, the sort of long commute, long distance commuting that's involved? A great deal. And it's causing conflicts about how far do they go? And then what do they risk in terms of exposure to modern ways. And it's not modernity that they object to because they feel confident in their faith 
but it's more whether it produces images or things that they would rather the family not, not see. And the problem of transportation, uh, there are some, well, one of the answers is to communally own transportation and to share it as they go to Amish markets. And so if you have an Amish owned market, you can have these trucks available which and hire drivers, but not have the expense of hiring out the, the whole truck. But uh, that is indeed a great concern also because they've got to be broken down every night. So it's not as if you can just put it in a freezer uh, somewhere and then go out. There is some discussion about that, about having more markets that are more semi-permanent, let's say. But one of the features of the Amish market is they tend to avoid that. And they, again, that view that we should be working and this should be fresh off the land. I think it's a good question and a problem that's occurring. One of the reasons I think there is a rise in Amish markets is to try and solve that problem, but then they have to find locations that are going to be appealing to people or within their vicinity. Uh, Mark, you know Ephrata, for example, and so that's an area that is off the beaten path, but nonetheless is already a kind of destination. And, and they do uh, like the Ephrata and uh, some of those areas within Roots and Green Dragon. If these places are not familiar, I'll be glad to talk about them offline or I describe them in more detail in, in the book. Got another... Green Dragon, by the way, I'm sure, Mark, I enjoy because oh, yeah. it's a place where you can hear Pennsylvania German Lots. spoken. Yeah, no, that's yeah. a fun one. That's a fun one. So we've got a question. I'm assuming that Thomas is, this is Thomas Nussbauer, who is, um, I believe, I mean, he's an ethnomusicologist from Innsbruck, Austria. And, I'm, and unless he's in Iowa right now, I'm guessing that Thomas is in the middle of the night uh, coming to us from Austria. So welcome, Thomas. Um, dear Professor Bronner, first of all, thank you. I didn't visit an Amish market in Kelowna, Iowa, but I saw a grocery store and I was impressed by the know-how and technology in the background. Highly developed solar technology, hydraulic technology, perfect organization. Where does this know-how come from and where did the Amish learn it? Well, they will work with Cooperative Extension. Uh, it's true, they're not gonna get ag degrees from Penn State, but because of the connection to Cooperative Extension, they uh, will work with them and they will have publications. And I should stress that even though they may not be going to high school, they are very literate society. And they're avid uh, readers of books and users of libraries. And uh, one of the largest events in Lancaster that I attend regularly is the Mennonite Historical Society Book Fair, Book Frolic, I think it, it's called. And you will see them scouring for books, including on agriculture and uh, seeking advice there. Here's a question from a longstanding friend of the Maxcata Institute in German American States, Frank Trommler, retired professor mm -hmm. um, of German at, uh, at Penn. And very simple, straightforward question from Frank. Has this expansion of the Amish population also increased the spread of Pennsylvania German? I, I think, Mark, you should answer that question. I will tell you, at least in my field work, there seems to be a reintegration Pennsylvania German, they are learning it and passing it down. What I'm interested in is in some of these areas that I mentioned they're going into that were formerly populated by Pennsylvania Germans and the children were not learning it, that they are attending for Samlinge and other kinds of social occasions where if a older Pennsylvania German speaker is there and they will see an Amish, they will jabber with them and then surprised that they're speaking differently. <laughs> uh, so that those are the situations in, in which in fact I see it, but you may have more comment because your field work has gone more widely on that. Within the markets themselves, again, it's not a German audience, but the families who are working it will speak to one another in Pennsylvania German because it's a workaday language for them. Mm -hmm. Great. So um, 
this comes from Rebecca Fulton, and she says, as someone who lives in a rural area near Erie, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. I see many small stores in the area that sell Amish baked goods and the non-supermarket items that you mentioned in your presentation, but they also have products like bulk foods in addition to powdered coffee drink mixes. However, I'm not quite sure if these are Amish stores or Mennonite ones. How could one tell the difference between the two types of stores, and is there really a difference? There in my survey, uh, there's certainly going to be similarities. Uh, some of the differences that you can see is that the Amish uh, are not going to have computers as much. They will have cash registers there, but that's often a sign. And also maybe because I was a student of Don Yoder, I've especially been attentive to dress, <laughs> which is uh, a, symbol that they know they're not brandishing to others but is a sign to them of their weeness if you will here's a comment coming from stephen shellen um just to sort of add here to uh talking building on the raw milk question so the raw milk sales are a concern in wisconsin and mm -hmm. and um, i could just add to that it's actually it, it includes um the mennonite uh, dairy farmers on that issue and it's come to there's been some controversy about that and actually not that far from from madison it's just uh, somewhat west of of here that the raw milk sale uh issue has kind of come up um i would i would invite you to again feel free to email me or, or mark can provide that i'd be curious to following that controversy because it is an area that the Amish have a niche economy, if you will, of serving a wider need. Uh, some of them will sell goat milk as well, but there is this matter about the cow milk. So here's a question from Barbara Lewis, and it's an interesting name because there is a, a, a Amish themed fiction writer named Barbara Lewis. Um, but I'm sure this is a different Barbara Lewis. But anyway, Barbara asks, when the Amish buy produce from supermarkets, are they concerned with qualities such as organic, non-GMO, or pesticide-free? Yeah, the uh, Amish are not organic, which is a, a misconception I had because of their farming methods. But uh, Amish products are not necessarily organic, and they're not necessarily looking for organically grown uh, products. They're interested in the uh, freshness of it there. And uh, that, that's just not a question. They do have more of a value on the social aspects of the, of the way it's grown, but it's uh, not this concern for not using pesticides or organically grown fertilizer or that kind of thing. Uh, and this may differ in, in some areas, but in central Pennsylvania, they are using some modern methods, but still trying to maintain horse drawn and tractor powered uh, kinds of produce. So here's a question from me. <laughs> right. um, Lancaster County traditionally has been uh, a very big center in the North for the cultivation of tobacco. Yeah, And in your field work has the discussion about, to, I mean, tobacco is obviously something that they don't sell at farmers markets, but it's still a big cash crop. Have any, have you heard any discussions or has it come up about either moving away from tobacco for health, moral, ethical reasons at all? Yeah, that wasn't the focus when I would ask or when I went about uh, this study, but certainly it would come up because they would talk about what's happened to farming and the ethical dilemmas that that causes. And there's a part of them that wants to see tobacco, which is still profitable to continue because it keeps them on the farm. But then on the other hand, they are concerned about the health factors and the conscience of that they're meant to do good and they wouldn't want to grow anything that hurts the public and the statistics, which I did have, I don't have them right in front of me, does show a marked decline in the number of tobacco farms in central Pennsylvania and the repurposing of tobacco barns, which is uh, another factor as well in their operation. And actually, uh, there's no more questions, so I'm going to put in another question here. I'll, uh, uh, 
exercise my privilege here. Um, is um, have you heard anything about say like um, Amish and maybe also Mennonite families, but Amish families that raise like ducks and um, certain kinds of you know produce foods or deliver foods to sort of niche markets. So like for example, halal meat to Muslims yeah. and Hasidim, uh, kosher products to Hasidim and um, I've heard also like ducks for uh, Asian um, uh, families or restaurants in Philly. Uh, yes, uh, that's not quite as pronounced in Lancaster, but I, I heard references to, well, in Berks County or in Montgomery County, they're doing some of that in the market. But I think it raises a larger point, again, Mark, about the lengths to try to maintain a tradition a tradition centered lifestyle and that is one of their specialties besides farming of crops is animal husbandry so they see the growing of animals and the training of animals as uh, very natural even if it's going to an urban market it's something where again they feel they're staying close to the land and something that is labor intensive where another ethical dilemma has come up is in the dog breeding uh, part and the accusation of puppy mills which are very sensitive to because they feel that they fulfill the commandment and the biblical mandate to be stewards and to have dominion over the land including its creatures uh, but that has gotten bad publicity and they're sensitive uh, to that. So I think you're going to see decline in those, even though when that first started, they thought again, this is a service that we're playing. And as long as there doesn't seem to be an ethical dilemma with uh, the ducks and goat, and especially the goat cheeses and other specialty product that they're uh, looking at, I, I think you're going to see that. Uh, just uh, one last point too, that often surprises people also is that uh, they are avid hunters. So the other aspect of that, even if they don't have a farm, is that they will hunt, they will go to slaughterhouses with their deer and bear and other things. And uh, in the cases where it's legal, they will resell that because there is a market for venison, which is another niche market that a lot of the English have abandoned. <laughs> All right, and then the rest are just your words of thanks from our uh, attendees. And so um, thank you so much, Simon, for a fantastic presentation. And thanks to all our attendees that came this evening for uh, wonderful questions and a discussion. And hope to see you virtually at, at future Moxcata Institute events. Thanks so if, much, Simon. If um, You're welcome. And if we can get in person, I promise to bring whoopie pies for everybody. I know I'm looking at these whoopie pies here at the, in the background. It's like, it's making me really hungry. It looks really good. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much. Ghost Dunk. Yeah. Easter Duncan. Yeah.